Good afternoon. If everybody would like to take their seat, we'll get rolling here in just a few moments. As we have a few other people joining us, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and hello everybody. I hope that you're all having a wonderful week. Today is certainly, I think, our busiest day of the conference. I am Jennifer Piklowski, and I'm here as the chair of your Strategic Action Planning Committee. And I'd first like to welcome and recognize our Vice Chair, Daryl Burns. <laughs> welcome again to Emerging Issues. As we begin today, our first topic is not actually an emerging issue, but we would say an ongoing issue. Our first speaker is Bill Dedman. He is a Pulitzer and Peabody award-winning investigative reporter and the author of the New York Times number one best-selling biography, Empty Mansions. He has worked on online news, video, newspapers, television, and magazines. Bill received the 1989 Pulitzer Prize in investigative reporting for The Color of Money. His series of articles in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution on racial discrimination by mortgage lenders in the middle-income black neighborhoods. The Color of Money was an influential early example of the power of using computers to gather and analyze public records, combined with shoe leather reporting to demonstrate how a segregated, excuse me, a segregated mortgage market was maintained. The Color of Money led to expanded federal laws on disclosure of loan data, new financing for middle-income home buyers, and a greater awareness of systemic discrimination. Bill was one of four lead reporters on Newsday's undercover investigation on racial steering by real estate agents called Long Island Divided. The investigation published in November of 2019 revealed that Long Island's dominant, excuse me, today, revealed that Long Island's dominant residential real estate brokers helped reinforce racial segregation through illegal steering of customers. Newsday's team received several national awards for their work, including Peabody, Polk, and Morrow Awards. Long Island Divided and its 40-minute documentary film, Testing the Divide, is available online. Bill got his start in journalism at 16 as a copy boy for the Chattanooga Times. He attended but not, did not graduate from Washington University in St. Louis, where he wrote for the newspaper Student Life and worked part-time at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Bill has written for the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and the first director of computer-assisted reporting for the Associated Press. Obviously, it sounds like I could go on and on, as his accomplishments are many. But please help me welcome Bill Dedman. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, John, and everyone who's helped to uh, put on this event. My theme for today is change. Um, you know, it's really good to be back in Missouri. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I went to Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, then I moved to Warrensburg and was the reporter at the Warrensburg paper. And uh, then my wife and I lived in Kansas City, about two blocks from here. I managed an apartment building and I drove a taxi cab. And uh, I went by that apartment building yesterday and uh, it had been torn down, thankfully. Um, I, I, uh, I'm quite sure that, that our first uh, child was uh, conceived uh, right near here, but I, I, I saw on my walk that that car had been towed away. So. So our theme today, our, our theme today is change. He, he's an assistant, uh, he lives in Columbia and he's a, a baseball coach at Mizzou now. Um, it may be surprising to you, it certainly was surprising to me when the National Association of Realtors and associations around the country have responded positively to a newspaper's investigation. 
It seems that our Newsday investigation, Long Island Divided, has sparked an important conversation and change with industry leaders saying, these are practices which need to change and soon. It does seem as though change has come quickly in the 18 months since we published. For example, when the head of Realogy, which as you know is America's largest real estate company, owns the brands Coldwell Banker, Century 21, Sotheby's International, and others, when that CEO says, we, Realogy, should be testing our own agents and brokers to see if they provide equal service to customers, then change is happening. When several real estate associations at the state level and several large city associations of realtors have said, we're going to test our members, then change is happening. And when NAR has embraced those proposals and says, we'll help you, we're going to help you organize those tests, then change is coming quickly. The thinking seems to be, if we don't get ahead of this, if we don't police ourselves, then others, government and the media, will keep doing it and we'll keep having these embarrassing investigations that harm our brand. I trust that all of you want to make sure that everyone who calls or emails or comes into your office is treated fairly. My goal for this session is for it to be helpful to you, but also challenging, giving you something to think about what changes what might we need to make. Now, I'd like to um, show you an introductory part of our documentary film. The, the series was called Long Island Divided, and the film version is called Testing the Divide. And they're all online at an address we'll give you at the end. You don't have to subscribe to get to them. They're not behind a paywall. These are some of our testers. Now here's an introductory part of our film. But you don't want to go there. It's a mixed neighborhood. Mixed neighborhood. If agents are courteous and professional, how can you know that they're treating you equally compared with someone of a different race or ethnicity? I have to say it without saying it, you know. Behind smiles and handshakes, how do you know if they're giving you fewer options or suggesting different areas? I'm not going to send you anything more unless you don't want to store your car to buy your friend. More that rules don't apply to you and another home buyer in the same way. Yeah, okay. I definitely need Long Island is one of America's most segregated suburbs. Newsday set out to discover what role real estate agents might play in keeping it that way, potentially affecting the quality of lives. Technically, as a real estate agent, you shouldn't the buyers. In house hunting, it's nearly impossible to see evidence of hidden discrimination. You would never know unless you go undercover. In one test, Johnny May Alston was the black tester, and Cindy Parry was the white tester. And they met with Anne-Marie Queeley Bichon at Signature Premier Properties office in Cold Spring Harbor. They asked for the same thing. As often happens, the agent discussed getting pre-qualified or pre-approved for a mortgage by a bank, showing how much a buyer can spend on a house. Are you pre-qualified, I guess? My uh, husband's working with somebody in a bank. We've done some preliminary Neither had been pre-approved or pre-qualified. Here's what the agent told the black tester. So I really need that. I won't take out anyone unless I do have a pre-qualification letter. So I need to... Well, that means I can't pre-qualify for a mortgage. 
Oh, so that means I can't go out to see anything. I won't, I won't do it. You can try another person, but I don't have the time. And without pre-approval, here's what the agent told the white tester. Okay. Um, what is your availability? When can you start looking at houses? Um, I would say not this coming week. Cindy received 79 listings from this agent. Johnny May couldn't get any listings. And Cindy, the white tester, received two home tours. They had the same finances, the same budget, and they made the same request in the same area. But one was white, the other was black. The agent treated them differently. Let me explain to you why Newsday did in this investigation. To set the scene, Long Island stretches east of New York City, a suburban area uh, with about three million people. And you know, it has a lot of diversity overall, but like much of America, though there are people from all backgrounds and races and religions, minority groups are in their own enclaves. On Long Island, for example, there are more than 200 communities and a majority of the black residents live in only eight. Now, is that by choice? We long have heard from black home buyers on Long Island who have encountered problems when they tried to look for a home outside of those few areas. We heard this even from our own colleagues at the newspaper. So we decided to follow the methods used by fair housing agencies, sending out testers to see agents, testers of different backgrounds. We added hidden cameras for audio and video. Now, a word about the law, that's legal in New York and it's legal in most states. It's legal in Missouri. Most states say it's legal for, if only one person in the conversation knows it's being recorded, you can record it. And that one person can be the home buyer, the tester. The main reason we did testing is that it's the only way to see whether two people are treated equally. And it's the only way to make sure that the tests are done fairly. You know, our testers often came back to us at the newspaper office and said, that agent was so nice. He was so helpful. They only learned the truth when we set them down together and they watched the videos of how the other tester was treated. And they looked at the maps of the listings that the other tester received. Let me give you a summary of our tests, how they were done. Our Newsday team focused on home sales only, no rentals. We'd send a white home buyer and then separately an Asian American home buyer, or Hispanic and then white, or white and then black. The home buyers gave the agents the same circumstances. They were first-time home buyers, so selling another property was not at issue. We matched up testers of the same gender and age. We dressed them in the same business casual style. I went to Nordstrom and bought purses for the women so they would all have a similar class of purses. They asked for the same geographic area, the same price range, the same number of bedrooms, and they were prepared to give the same income or the same credit score if asked, but rarely was anyone asked any financial information other than their mortgage pre-approval status on which they were the same. We shopped for houses from entry level. Now in the New York City area uh, on Long Island, uh, entry level is about $400,000 up to a high-end $7 million. Now, $7 million will not get you Alec Baldwin's house in the Hamptons on Long Island, but it will get you into his neighborhood. But then you would have Alec Baldwin for a neighbor. <laughs> How did we pick the agents to test? We did not pick them. The brokers picked which agents would be tested, though they didn't know it. Whoever they had on call on the board, whoever was handling walk-ins, whoever was taking email or telephone contacts to the office, that's who we tested. We did 86 of these tests, 86 paired uh, matched tests, 
at 12 companies, 12 brands, and we chose them because together they have more than half of the listings on Long Island. And they're familiar names to you, Coldwell Banker, Keller Williams, Century 21, Remax, Douglas Elliman, some smaller regional brands. Before we published, our team gave all the details to the agents we had tested and to the brokers and invited them to come in and watch the videos and to respond. And then we put all the videos and those responses up online with the stories. So there was no out of context. In other words, this was not a drive-by investigation. This was a careful effort that took a team more than three years. Now, the results. Asian American buyers were treated differently than their white counterparts 19% of the time. So, two out of 10 on average. Hispanic American buyers were treated differently than their white counterparts 39% of the time. Four out of 10. And African American buyers were treated differently than their white counterparts 49% of the time. Five out of 10. Now, most of the attention has been on that difference for black customers and white, but I would say let's not lose sight of the rest. If we're finding these differences and we're more than half a century since the civil rights laws were passed, then those seem significant as well. Out of the 12 companies, only two companies, and these were two of the smallest regional companies, were the only ones to pass all of their tests. So it is fair to say that these real estate companies were contributing to the racial segregation in our suburbs. Now you no doubt have already asked yourself the most important question. If we repeated the test this weekend in your communities, if this weekend black and white and Asian and Hispanic testers go shopping for homes in Kansas City or Knob Noster, are they going to get the same level of service and get the same listings? Or home buyers who are Christian or Muslim or Jewish, straight couples, gay couples, couples with children, couples without children. The test is on Monday morning when they check their email, will they be receiving listings for the same homes? That's the test. Now, what sort of differences did we see? First, we just saw differences in the quantity of service, the level of service. For example, overall, our white testers got 50% more, 50% more listings than our black buyers. We saw differences in how buyers were screened. Some agents for example, refused to work with our Latino or black buyers until first they signed an exclusive contract with that brokerage. They said that's the rule of our office. But the same agent didn't require a contract from the white buyers. And we saw steering. Telling one person that there's no housing in your price range there, that you won't find anything for your money in that area and showing housing in that price range in that area to another buyer. That's steering, and we saw that. Making comments about the race or ethnicity or religion of people who live in a certain area, or comments about the schools, comments about crime, comments about resale value, as a way of encouraging or usually discouraging someone from looking in that area that's steering too, and we saw that. Especially when the agent gives contrary information or is silent on those matters with the other buyer. Now we've been discussing this in terms of individual buyers, but think of it for a moment from the neighborhood perspective. You know, our testers would ask for an area, let's say within half an hour of that downtown. And that area, that circle includes a lot of communities, a lot of towns and neighborhoods and schools. And then sometimes what we would see is the wider residential parts of that circle, those listings would be given 
only to the white buyer. We understand that's steering. The minorities are being steered around those communities. That's what we were testing for, and we saw. We also saw something else. We had minority communities where no one got the listings. Those minority areas are in the circle for both buyers. There are homes for sale in those minority areas on that day in that price range. And the agents didn't give those listings to either buyer. That's also steering, also illegal. These were the communities with more than a modest amount of black population, and the agents routinely steered around them for everyone. Our legal experts said, wait a minute, what a rich minefield that is. Who has the lawsuit in that case? It's a long list. Not only are the white and minority home buyers being steered, you understand that both the white and the minority home buyers are being harmed by being steered around the minority communities. But also, so are the being harmed are the people who are trying to sell a home in that area and their listing brokers and the governments, the communities have a lawsuit and you understand why. Fewer lookers means lower prices, means lower appreciation, means lower equity. It means less money to send the grandkids to college and for retirement. And from the communities, it means less tax money for schools and playgrounds and parks. What we saw in our tests makes me wonder if brokers make any effort to know whether steering is happening in their offices. Brokers, do you check on which listings your agents give to buyers and how those choices match up with the actual criteria given by the buyers? You know, you know how it works in our office, in our test, we would watch the, the, the agent would have a brief conversation with the, the buyer and then would turn to a computer screen and start to generate listings. This is all very familiar to you. And they would click on the, in the MLS or in their proprietary software, selecting schools and communities and attributes of the home to generate listings. And if you think about it, that's the moment when steering is happening. From a risk management perspective, that means that the records are in the computer and they'll end up in court. From a risk management perspective, I'm, I'm wondering, does your MLS let you know, brokers, which communities your agents are skipping over when they hand out listings? That doesn't prove illegal discrimination, but it's a red flag to go ask about the criteria given by the buyers. If your MLS is not giving you those records, perhaps you should be demanding them. Now, here's a video clip with just a classic example of steering. One man shopping for his family, his, himself, his wife, and their teenager is told that a community would uh, be a nice place to live with the nicest neighbors. And another man, shopping for himself and his wife and their teenager, is told that it's a dangerous place. Kelvin Toon is a black man in his early 50s, and he went in to meet with an agent involving a test in the Brentwood community, a community that is 80% Hispanic and black. The agent communicated to Kelvin, our black tester, that she enjoyed meeting with clients from the Brentwood area. Every time I get a new listing in Brentwood or a new client, I get so excited because they're the nice people. When we sent Kelvin's counterpart in to meet with the same agent, the white tester was actually uh, warned about Brentwood not being a nice place. The nursery home we need to be near is 
is near is in Brentwood. Okay. And so we found a couple that are in Brentwood. Pretty close to each other. Okay. And it just seemed like those would be handy also for going. Do you want to give me them and I'll look into them for you? Or? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. That warning came later to the white testers saying there was concern about gang activity going on in Brentwood. <laughs> This agent wanted the white tester to know, but that information wasn't provided uh, to Kelvin, the black tester. The listings centered black tester Kelvin in Brentwood with 27 house listings, while the white tester got zero listings in Brentwood and was directed towards much whiter neighborhoods. Interesting, um, minority buyers were not subjected to racist comments or inappropriate remarks. We are long past the days of signs that say whites only. It was the white buyers who heard inappropriate remarks or guidance that violates the law about race and its proxies, schools, crime, and resale values. Here's a video clip that's about inappropriate comments by agents. They really took over Springs in Northwest Woods area. Here, an agent gives conflicting advice about Freeport. I like Freeport. Now you have a bad school district, and, and that's not good for resale value. All school bonds. See the moms that are hanging out on the corners. But you don't want to go there. It's a mixed neighborhood. Yeah. We need okay. United Nations. Okay. Because you might be more comfortable in a certain demographic area that isn't heavily one way or the other or it's more of the people who are cute. Bayshore has two school districts, Brentwood and Bayshore. You don't want to have Brentwood school districts. You want to have Bayshore school districts. I can't say anything, but I encourage you, I want you to go there at 10 o'clock so at night if you want to buy diapers. Go to that 7-Eleven. They didn't buy that. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. I have to say it without saying it. You know, you have the knowledge of the areas. Yes. Uh, I don't want to use the word steer, but I try to edge. I'll use the no, word hey, I listen, educate absolutely. in the areas. That's, that's... You know? Yeah. How are you, Russ? How hey, are you Russ? Doing? Good. How are you? We're either waiting for the owner or waiting for the agent to show up. You don't want to be... I don't think you should be in Elmont. Uh, I think you should... Probably just be Franklin Square. And I remember um, specifically, he talked about steering. Yes, that's what he said. Um, steering, yes. yeah. <laughs> and in the same breath, he mentioned, well, steering is bad, but this is what I'm going to do. There's something called steering. No steering, you know, like steering. Oh, like a car or something? No, oh. like a horse, you know. It seems that some agents have gotten the message through the years that fair housing compliance is some sort of political correctness, that it means not saying the wrong thing, or not saying the wrong thing to the wrong person who might complain about it. Our tests suggest that we need more attention to steering and to differential treatment on what agents do and not just what they say. Now let's talk about schools. Time and again, our agents would explain to the buyers everything is decided by schools. Agents touted one district over another. Some were blue ribbon and others were declining. Often the agents gave conflicting information to different buyers. It seemed that agents had a very detailed map on the tip of their mind of school district boundaries, and which ones white buyers should avoid. Let's step back and get a bit of context. America's school districts, in many communities, are so segregated based on race and ethnicity that directing someone toward or away from a certain school is the same as directing them to an area of higher or lower minority population, even if you don't mention race. 
It is a shock, but America's school districts are more segregated now than they were when I graduated from high school. And school segregation and housing segregation are intertwined, of course, because we have school districts. Now, around the country, some agents have picked up on the idea, well, I can't talk about schools. You may have heard agents say, I can't mention schools. But the fair housing laws don't say that. Our legal advisors were very clear on this. Agents can hand out straightforward, factual information. Agents can say where their kids went to school. Agents can refer customers to websites with information. The legal problem arises when agents are picking and choosing different districts for different customers or steering all customers around districts with certain demographics. Here's a discussion of schools from our video, and then we'll dig into this a little bit more. You'll meet here the law professor from Kentucky who was an advisor on our project. In Newsday's 86 pair tests, agents often applied a laser-like focus on school districts, highlighting their perceived quality when recommending places that house hunters should consider buying or avoid. Fair housing experts say touting or disparaging school districts can put agents in jeopardy because talking about school districts can be taken as a euphemism for race. There's a few districts that I know I would like not like I won't look in those towns. Oh, okay. You know, like Freeport and Baldwin and Amityville, which is part of Massapequa schools, but it's just certain parts of Massapequa. If the customer asked about the quality of the schools and the agent responded with accurate information, I think the agent would be fine. The problem with talking about differentials in schools is that at least in the last 10 or 15 years, that has been a proxy for race. They don't mention the race of the community. Good schools are available in these areas. Those areas I'd stay away from because they have poor schools. I want to ask, did you tell that to the other tester? If you're only giving that information to one tester of the two and the only difference is the race, then you've provided what I call differential service. You're only, if you're in Massapequa, you only want school district 23. Okay. You don't want six in Massapequa because that takes in Amityville. You're not going to like those schools. The agent writing there helpfully made a list for each tester so they could bring back to the Newsday office different lists of recommended schools. I'd like to mention that it is okay to tell your customers if they ask about schools, it's okay to tell them about the fair housing laws. It is okay to say, you know, there are fair housing laws that limit what any agent can say about schools. And we have these laws, by the way, for a very good reason, because there's a long, ugly history of people having segregation pushed upon them. It's also okay to educate your buyers and say, did you know that school test scores don't tell you how good schools are? Write that on the blackboard 100 times. School test scores don't tell you how good the schools are. School test scores tell you almost entirely how educated and wealthy are the parents who send their kids to that school. And it's okay to say to buyers, you know, you should do your homework. If schools are important to you, you should call the principal. Talk to the band director. If you can, go visit the schools. You know, if they were shopping for boats, they would go look at boats. I'm often asked, do you think the agents in these tests were intentionally steering? Was it knowingly or maybe some sort of unconscious bias? Some agents did whisper, I shouldn't be saying this, but 
which I guess is the real estate equivalent of, hey, buddy, would you hold my beer? <laughs> Unconscious bias is an interesting topic. Implicit bias is, is worth us wondering about. I'm not dismissing that. But I think the first thing to understand is that it doesn't matter at all if the agents are doing this on purpose. The Fair Housing Act and your state and local laws govern behavior, not thoughts or motives. The law is not a mind reader. It's the effect of your actions, not your intent, that determines whether or not they're legal. And this really isn't surprising. Do you imagine the IRS asks, did you intend not to report this income? If a real estate agent is showing one person different communities than another, treating one person better than another, and the differences between them are one of the categories in the federal or state fair housing laws, then the agent and the broker have violated the law. To remind you, in the federal law, those categories are color, race, religion, national origin, disability, sex, and family status, which we usually mean having children or not, or being pregnant. Although practically intent doesn't matter, it is worth digging into why agents might be steering if it's something that we want to stop doing. It appears that some agents may be profiling, that is, assuming that one person in front of them can't qualify for the mortgage or may not be able to afford the price range that they've given, but then accepting the same information from another person. Um, you know, a funny thing about profiling is how ineffective it is. Um, you know, we have uh, TV shows about FBI crime profilers, and we talk about profiling as though it's some shortcut to success. Um, experts in counterterrorism, in uh, uh, preventing school shootings in various fields say the real problem with profiling is that it doesn't work. You waste too many investigative resources trying to look for a type of person as opposed to looking for a type of behavior. Uh, for example, in school shootings, um, who, who uh, w plays violent video games or who dresses a certain way, these are not good predictors of who will be a school shooter. What are good predictors? Acquiring weapons, um, making threats, saying don't be in the cafeteria on Thursday. <laughs> These are good predictors. And in real estate terms, you're in a commission business. So you leave money on the table if you assume that some people can't qualify for the home or the mortgage. Not to mention, steering is illegal. Now, why do it? Some agents may think consciously or not, as you heard one agent say, you should look where you'll feel comfortable, where there are people of just one type and not another. And agents may think that they're just creating a shortcut by sorting customers by race, which maybe is where they want to end up anyway. But why assume that people want segregated neighborhoods? And why assume that the person in front of you or the name on the email, that person isn't already married to or has kids of a different race or religion or nationality? Can we imagine other justifications for steering? Some agents may be bowing to bias that they expect from others. They might expect that the seller or uh, the seller's neighbors who are potential customers uh, might be upset if you bring a minority person into the community. The agents might be thinking that there's bias on the part of the realtor, uh, no, the appraiser, I mean to say, or the, or the uh, 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 loan originator. And we've seen long histories and studies right up to this month of bias in appraisal and in lending. Nevertheless, the burden falls on you to make sure that you treat every customer fairly. A final possible explanation, logically, is that some realtors might be biased. And I suspect that this is a very tiny group, so small as to be irrelevant to our discussion. 
there's just too much steering going on for only bad people to be doing it. Good people have to be doing it too. One of the patterns that startled us was when agents would start their presentations to buyers, remember these were new customers, with information that violated the fair housing laws. Here you'll meet some of their, our testers and a fair housing expert who works with them. It almost makes me wish that the racism is more explicit so that I would know about it. Too often I hear people who don't, maybe aren't as familiar with this kind of work, say, oh, well, they were just testers. But all you have to do is tell someone, which I have to do on a fairly regular basis, that you were turned down because of your race and tell them the circumstances that occurred on a particular test and you will see just how real and painful that injury is. Elmont, you know, it's, it's okay, it's good, you're very close to the city. Um, some of them are not as nice, you know, Elmont. I do remember him, he was nice, and I do remember him pointing out on the map. Oh, and he said, loved that map, I yeah, like he, that. <laughs> yeah, he had the map and he's like, you know. Some of these towns, in my opinion, are not necessarily the greatest, in terms of school district, safety, you know, crime, resale. The National Association of Realtors has responded vigorously to our stories, and I'd, I'd like to address a couple of uh, the elements in the new NRA, NAR program. NAR says that changing the culture may be the toughest part because there's such a long history of government and business working together to produce redlining, block busting, subprime lending in minority areas, and steering. You're all uh, uh, well aware that your Realtor Code of Ethics makes fair housing an important component. You may not be old enough to know that for 50 years that same Code of Ethics made it a violation to sell a home in a white neighborhood to a black person. NAR just this past year apologized for that long history for opposing the fair housing laws. One of NAR's new programs that many of you have seen is a simulation or game called Fair Haven. It's really a video game where you're learning fair housing pitfalls that come up while you're trying to close deals. It's really well done. And uh, it takes about an hour to go through it. It's at, in a, it's at uh, fairhaven.realtor. And I uh, encourage you to have everybody in your office, everybody in your associations take Fairhaven. I'd like to mention three other quick steps that NAR has taken. First, NAR has been working with state associations like this one to examine and toughen laws on fair housing, tightening regulations having to do with violations. Now, that's a completely new thing to think, a national trade group encouraging its state associations to have tougher regulations on their members. Second, NAR is supporting those communities, those associations, those companies that want to do self-testing of their agents. Though it would be private testing, you wouldn't see that on YouTube, but it could cause you to lose your, your position with a company, and in a way, that might have the greatest long-term impact. And third, NAR is rolling out a new course, you'll see it at the end of this year, on implicit bias and ways to recognize that bias that we, we all may have and that we might use without thinking about it. And you'll see that three-hour CE class at the end of the year. All of this seems very useful. You know, we would think, as journalists uh, dealing with these testers and watching the videos, we would think, how hard would it be to stop steering? Let me share a few lessons that I think I've learned from this investigation and from some previous work. Um, when I was much younger, I researched and wrote a series of articles in Atlanta called The Color of Money about mortgage lenders making loans on one part of the map and not another. And we dug into how the banks operated in Atlanta, and 
you know, it was very striking that they were making loans even in poor white areas, but not in the affluent black areas where executives from Delta Airlines and Coca-Cola lived. We found differences in branch locations where branches had been open and closed. We found differences in which real estate agents the lenders marketed to. Even differences in where you could put in a loan application. Now, fast forward to the 2000s. At the Boston Globe, I worked with a team on a story about what you would think would be a completely different sort of customer interaction. Traffic tickets. Um, uh, trust me, an interesting thing about being stopped by an officer for speeding is that I was speeding. We were all speeding. We were all pre-qualified for the ticket. <laughs> now let's say that the officer lets me off with a warning. Do I have any way of knowing whether the officer lets other drivers going the same speed off with a warning? I do not. What we found in Massachusetts by looking at every ticket and every warning in the state was that it's pretty easy to predict the result if you know the sex, age, and race of the driver. For example, women much more often got a warning that break for women runs out just after age 40. <laughs> it's the same as who gets roles in Hollywood or who gets a drink bought for them in the bar. Minorities, especially black and Latino men, especially if they were younger, were much more likely than others to get the ticket. That series is online. It's called Speed Trap. Now, taking together these three very different stories about redlining and traffic tickets and steering, uh, what lessons do I think I've learned from those? First, the absence of complaints in your office tells you nothing about whether or not your office is complying with the law no one would know what listings another customer was given. Second, diversity efforts alone will not fix this. There are lots of reasons that your industry and mine needs to employ and promote more minority members. But we saw different treatment by police officers who are black or white or Asian. We saw different treatment by real estate agents of many backgrounds who were all steering. Third, small policies and small actions can have a huge impact in perpetuating a segregated system. It seems clear that many realtors did not have a standard procedure for intaking new clients. They didn't have a checklist. After my stories in Atlanta, um, uh, the banks put uh, lenders on a, a, a a bus to show them the very nice uh, uh, minority neighborhoods, black subdivisions that they'd never heard of, um, and it really blew apart their stereotypes. It, it might be that uh, a bus tour in your area is not a bad idea today. Um, many realtors did not know minority areas, did not have listings there, did not have offices there. Um, remember that differences in treatment can be unintentional based on bias, Maybe, but more likely just based on oversight or stereotype. That's what me, people mean by systemic discrimination. They mean it's not a person doing it on purpose. It's the way the office runs. It seemed clear that the agents we were dealing with did not have a consistent way of qualifying customers. Do you ask credit scores or income of every customer or none? Either one is okay. Requiring every buyer to be pre-approved is fine. Requiring no buyers to be pre-approved is fine. You'll educate them, you'll hook them up with a lender. It's in between when agents can decide when to relax that requirement for some buyers. That's how you end up on YouTube. <laughs> I wanna give uh, our law professor, Bob Schwimm from Kentucky, a final word on this in a very short video clip. He really steps up to the plate here. I'm a law professor at the University of Kentucky and I've been a law professor for a long number of years. All we're asking in these tests, you've got two people who come in and ask for exactly the same thing. Why don't you give them the same listing? Why don't you 
uh, pre-qualify them in exactly the same way. It's not that big a burden. This is a law. This should be treated like a tax law or any other law. Uh, you have to obey this law, and particularly if you're in a licensed business like real estate agents, uh, you, if you can't obey the law, you ought to just get out. Now, the professor really steps up there. Uh, I think the complication in what he's saying is that I trust that all of you want to obey the law. Not wanting to obey the law isn't actually the problem here. The pro problem may be recognizing how differences in treatment might creep in to your process. You know, NAR offers a, a straightforward suggestion for how to avoid steering. Please listen closely to this simple suggestion. Provide customers with listings based on their objective criteria. Home size, a corner lot or not, a pool or not. Not on vague terms such as nice neighborhood or good schools or safe. As the professor is saying, if you gave all the customers all the listings within their price range, meeting their attributes, then we wouldn't have steering. So the best way to stop illegal steering may be to stop steering customers at all. Stop picking their neighborhoods and their schools. I hope that you will share our stories and our video with your colleagues and with your customers. Post it on Facebook. The stories are called Long Island Divided. We called the film Testing the Divide. They're both at the same address, which is simply newsday.com slash divided. Have a movie night and have a conversation. Pass the microphone around in your office and practice giving a legal and community supportive answer to the question, which are the good schools? The right answer is realtors don't know which schools are good. You have to do your own homework. Have everybody go through Fairhaven. Do some practice. Talk about those simple procedures for new customers. What are the specific steps that we can take? We all want to make sure everybody's treated fairly. How do we make sure, since it's our broker's license on the line, that that happens? I want to thank you for sharing your time with me, for your attention. Thank you so much. Bill, that was a great presentation. We all enjoyed it, and it uh, obviously is a topic that we need to be ever vigilant on. <clears throat> we now go virtually to Washington, D.C. for an inside look on potential tax changes swirling around Congress and the implication for our industry. We are pleased to welcome Evan Lidyard. Evan joined the National Association of Realtors in 2013 after serving for more than 20 years as the senior tax policy advisor to Senator Orrin G. Hatch, Republican from Utah, the former chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. Mr. Lidyard was Senator Hatch's lead advisor on tax policy, as well as issues relating to the budget, financial services, and Social Security. Evan previously served as Senator Hatch's legislative director, coordinating and directing the senator's legislative efforts in all areas. In the middle of his Senate career, Evan took a three-year hiatus from Capitol Hill to be a partner at the legislative tax practice of KPMG's National Tax Office in Washington, D.C. Evan, thanks for joining us today. So what's really going on at the Capitol? What are we doing about the budget ceiling and continuing resolution? Well, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me. It's great to be with you for a few minutes this afternoon. I wish I had some solid answers for you. About the only thing I can say with certainty is that the Congress has passed the continuing resolution so we won't have a government shutdown tonight. Everything else is pretty much up in the air right now, however. In fact, 
in my nearly 35 years of watching Capitol Hill very closely, this is probably the most confusing week I've ever seen. And it's also probably the week that it has the highest stakes for one party or the other that I've seen in that amount of time too. In this case, the stakes are very high for the Democrats because they're trying to pass uh, not only the, um, the so-called um, infrastructure bill that passed the Senate last month, but they, they, they wanna pass that today, but they also want to move forward, at least make progress on the, the huge $3.5 trillion human infrastructure bill that is also pending and that they're also trying to get uh, big progress done today. I'm worried that they won't get uh, either one of those accomplished, but I've been wrong before and it's very possible uh, that we could see one or both of those uh, uh, objectives met or, or neither one uh, today. And then the other thing they have hanging over their heads is the debt limit increase that needs to be taken care of by about the 18th of October. So all those things are out there pending. Let me quickly shift gears and talk about the tax elements. As you probably all heard, uh, all, all during the year, the president has had some ideas for raising taxes on the so-called wealthy that could impact real estate investment. There were three things we were particularly concerned with as we've been going through this year. Number one, a, a change or a, a cut back to the 1031 like kind exchange, which we've been most concerned about. Second, uh, a change to the step up in basis on, on property, uh, especially land and other real estate. Uh, so when it's pass, passed on to heirs, uh, they, they have to pay tax or the estate, estate of the individual owner has to pay tax. Uh, or uh, the third one was the idea of having a taxation of capital gains upon the death of the owner of real property. The good news, if there is good news at this point, is that the Ways and Means Committee on the 15th of this month passed out a bill that didn't include any of those things in it, uh, although it's still possible that it could come back in. Uh, we think we're going to be okay on like kind of exchanges. We don't think we're gonna see a change in the step up in basis, but we do think that there's going to be an increase in the capital gains tax rate for people earning perhaps more than 400,000 or 500,000 a year. Perhaps it'll go back up to the uh, million dollar limit that the president was looking at. We just don't know. Most of the focus is on people with a higher income or higher wealth. But the way it's going to go, it looks like, is if they can come to a deal in principle on this big $3.5 trillion deal, it will come down in value to maybe one and a half to two trillion, which is still a huge, huge bill that's going to require a lot of tax offsets. If we're lucky, we won't see anything except maybe a capital gains increase. And that might be 25% to 28%, which is still quite serious, even if it only hits people making over a half million or a million a year. It could still hurt the market. It could still stall uh, commercial real estate thing uh, uh, transactions, and it's not good news at all. There could be other provisions as well. We just don't know yet. And so I, I'm here to say that we're, we're in a, a state of flux and it's either there's going, either going to be something happen tonight, which is quite unlikely, or I think it's going to be pushed off till Thanksgiving or even Christmas time before they come up with something. But if they don't come up with uh, passing these two bills or the one bill and, and an agreement on the other, then I think that uh, it puts some great uncertainty into President Biden's economic agenda. But we'll have to see what happens for the rest of the day. And with that, I'll see if there's any time for any questions at all. And if not, then I'll, I'll say thank you again for inviting me to be with you for a few minutes. Question for, for Evan. Evan. Okay, thank you guys very much. Thank you, a, really a great forum today filled with wonderful information, lots of great things to think about and take home. To Mr. Dedman, thank you very much for being with us, and Evan, thank you for being with us virtually today. Now I'll just ask that we take the lead from our president, Janet Judd, and remember that ideas do matter. The brainstorming and problem solving, it doesn't stop here. So please keep the ideas coming and the conversations going on the landing.
Thank you, Jennifer. Looking forward as we prepare for our winter business conference in January, we want to know what is important to you. What emerging issues concern you, worry you, pique your interest, pique your interest the most? Please share your ideas with myself on the landing or with staff. Thanks again to our 2020, 2021 chair, Jennifer Piglowski, who led us so successfully this year. Now, please stay right where you are as the Missouri Realtors annual meeting and awards, as well as Leadership Academy graduation, will begin momentarily in this room. Thank you.